the candidates tournament is going on right now and some of the play from these uh, players is really astonishing i mean they have really advanced chess to an amazing level they're doing incredible incredible things over the board however the greatest achievement in the history of the candidates of course these are this is the tournament to determine who will play for the world championship who will take on the current world champion the greatest achievement in the candidates by far came from bobby fisher in fact the reason we talk about fisher as the greatest to ever play or at least in the top three with uh, carlson and kasparov is because of what happened in 1971 leading up to his match with spassky he played mark Taimanov into it was a best of 10 and he beat him six games to nothing no one could do that today i mean flat out none of the top players you would never be able to do that today couldn't happen then he goes against bent larson who other than fisher was probably the best non-soviet player in the world at that time six and owed him in a best of 10 and then in the final match before to qualify for the world championship he played tigran petrosian and beat him six and a half two and a half which is probably even more impressive than the uh, shutouts of timonov and larson and remember petrosian was at the peak of his strength he had been world champion not much earlier uh just uh, maybe three years before this match took place absolutely astonishing and we're going to look today at the game he played against bent larson the first game of their match and he does some things here that are absolute wizardry. And uh, Fisher has the white pieces. Larson has black. Let us jump right in. E4, E6, the French defense from Larson. B4, knight C3, and bishop to B4, the winner of variation. And it was known that these were not Fisher's favorite structures. So Larson is trying to get him into uncomfortable waters. Uh, the winner doesn't follow normal strategic rules. Fisher gains space with e5 and of course the idea of queen g4 hitting the now undefended g7 pawn is very common in the winner where black's king side is somewhat vulnerable here knight to e7 and a3 forcing the bishop to well he has to take on c3 at this point pawn takes b takes c3 and uh, black and black has given up a great minor piece this dark squared bishop for what may look like mysterious reasons but he has played down the C file with these weak pawns on uh, C3 and C2. And also Black has a plan where he actually was going to attack on the king side, which looks ridiculous at the moment. But uh, he could play F6 and then maybe G5, castle long, and uh, Black can get a pretty uh, serious attack here if White is not careful. He continues, Larson does, to attack D4. And here the main move is queen to G4. But there are other options, and here Fisher plays the most positional option, probably a4. The idea, the main idea of this uh, is th of this move is to play bishop c1 a3 to take over the diagonal that Black no longer controls because he gave up his own dark squared bishop. So now White wants to play uh, the bishop to a3 to control that key diagonal. Knight b to c6, knight f3, and bishop to d7. Larson has three minor pieces developed to Fisher's one, so uh, he's getting developed now. Bishop to d3. The bishop is on a very strong diagonal, but Fisher is inviting the move c4, which could completely lock the structure. Queen to c7, castles, and here Larson does exactly that. He plays c4, completely locking the structure, and of course bishop e2 is really the only move Fisher has here. And Botvinnik had uh, observed that this was not Fisher's favorite kind of structure. Now, it may look like this is going to lead to a maneuvering game. That is not actually true. Uh, what's going to happen is this center is going to explode. Uh, that's really Black's idea here, and you're going to see a lot of tactics and attacking potential in this game. F6. Larson immediately puts pressure on the front of White's pawn chain with F6. If Fisher were to take, uh, Black is fine here. He could just cast a long, move his rook to the G file, and attack. So Fisher plays rook to E1, now knight to G6. Black has immense pressure on the E5 pawn. Queen, knight, pawn, two knights and a pawn. Uh, and Fisher again doesn't want to take on f6. So he plays bishop to a3, the move he intended when he played a4 in the first place. Controlling key squares, black cannot castle kingside if he had wanted to. Uh, and this is a pawn sacrifice. Uh, the e5 pawn will now fall, and Larson takes that pawn. Pawn takes, pawn takes, takes with the knight, knight takes, knight takes. Uh, at the moment, Fisher does have some counterplay for that pawn, though. Of course, he has the bishop pair. Black's king is in the middle of the board, moves like bishop to h5, check, could be coming. So uh, Fisher has some counterplay for that pawn. This next move is quite strong, queen to d4. And now he is threatening bishop to h5, check, which would uh, 
perhaps win some material. So Larson plays knight to g6. Looks like he's hanging that g7 pawn, but again, Larson can just castle long and play on that g file, and it's the kind of position black wants here. Uh, so instead, Fisher plays bishop to h5, building up some pressure on, uh, on the king side. Um, and castling long doesn't quite work here because that undefended a7 pawn is actually black's problem at the moment. So black cannot castle. Uh, so Fisher has a, a real potent attack in the middle of the board. Uh, King to f7 was played by Larson. Basically, what he wants to do is uh, castle by hand, as they say. He moves the rook over, and the king can tuck in at g8. Uh, so he gets a castling, castle type position without actually executing the castling maneuver. But Fisher's next move is very strong. f4, a powerful shot, threatening f5 and undermining this d5 pawn. And he could cause black's entire pawn chain to collapse. And it's really hard to see how black can stop that. Larson plays rook h to e8, continuing that plan of artificial <clears throat> castling. And Fisher continues his plan of undermining the d5 pawn with f5. e f5, queen takes d5, check. The king goes to f6. If uh, bishop to e6, then just rook takes, rook takes. And then queen to f5, check would be very, very strong. If the rook were to block the check, then the queen goes back. And then when the rook moves, rook to f1, check would win material because the pawn is no longer blocking. Uh, the f file, he would just win material. So Larson goes ahead and plays king to f6 instead. Uh, king looks quite vulnerable, but Fisher's next move actually lets Larson back into the game. Um, the best move, according to modern technology, is bishop to d6, uh, cutting that queen off from the center, and after queen c6, queen d4 check, king f7, then bishop to f3, which is the move Fisher actually plays in the game. Uh, and the threat, he's hit, hitting the queen, and the threat of bishop to d5 check is quite, quite devastating. Uh, Fisher goes ahead and plays bishop to f, f3 here. Uh, Larson plays knight to e5, threatening to take off that very nice bishop with his knight. So Fisher plays queen to d4. He pins that knight, so he cannot do that, but Larson just steps out of the pin, renewing the threat of knight takes f3 check. So Fisher makes a very risky decision. He gives up a rook and gets two minor pieces in exchange for it. Normally, that's a good exchange. However, to do so, he gives Larson a blistering attack. The rolls reverse, and Fisher is the one that has to find miracle defensive moves. He takes the knight with a rook. Queen takes. And now, queen takes bishop. Uh, if he just takes here, he would just be down in exchange. So that whole idea was to take the bishop. And he's, gotten the, he's got the bishop pair for a rook. But now Larson gets to have a little bit of fun. First, he plays rook a to d8. Now, we see his heavy pieces crushing down, crashing down through the middle of the position. Fisher grabs a pawn at b7, but it's not about grabbing a pawn. The pawn happened to be there, but he's actually trying to get access to a key square, which we will see in a minute. Larson plays queen to e3 check, and there's only one right decision here. If Fisher were to play king to h1, then boom, queen to e1, rook takes, rook takes as a back rank mate. So he has to move his king toward the center, toward the fire of black's pieces, and now rook to d2. And look at this. Larson is one move away from mating on f2, and I have to say, to the, for the eye test, white looks lost. I could see some lower-rated players actually resigning uh, in this position. Um, but Fisher had seen a little deeper, and now he plays queen to c6 check. That's why he took that b7 pawn, so he'd have access to the c6 square now. So he takes that, uh, moves there with check. Now rook to e6. It looks like he's just, you know, even in even worse shape than he was before. His queen is under threat, and there's the mate threat. But again, Fisher has seen deeper. These are miracle moves. Bishop to c5. Counterattacking the queen, but also preventing the mate. The queen can't play queen to f2 mate. Nevertheless, it still looks extremely dangerous. Arson plays rook to f2 check, forcing the king to g1. Now there's a discovery. The problem, of course, is the queen, the checking piece after the discovery, is also being attacked. So it's really just balancing on a very uh, thin thread here. Larson plays rook, takes g2, check. King takes g2, then queen to d2, check. So what he has done is, by giving up that rook and delivering this check, he's now going to be able to take Fisher's queen. Fisher is giving up that queen. King goes to h1, rook takes c6, and bishop takes c6. So the dust has settled a little bit here. Larson has a queen, 
And he also has uh, some kingside pawns that can advance. And for the moment, it looks like white's king is in greater danger than black's. However, if we look at this a little more closely, we see things are better for white than it might seem at first. These bishops are unbelievably strong, and they basically control any diagonal that black could check white's queen from, I mean, his king from. And uh, these two bishops with this rook are really powerful here, much more so than the queen and these uh, f and g pawns. Queen takes c3, rook to g1 check, king to f6, and now bishop takes a7. And Fisher has an, a passed a pawn, and he has his tool for victory, what he needs to use to win the game, which is, of course, to advance that a pawn. Uh, g5 comes from uh, Larson. Again, modern computers show this is a mistake and actually say the correct move is king to e6, but no human being plays like that. You just don't move your king into the middle of the firepower of your opponent's position. Uh, it's just not realistic. Uh, but g5 was played. But the problem with those is that it is slow and gives Fisher time to do what he wants to do. He plays bishop to b6 now to escort, help escort this a pawn forward. The bishop controls the a5 square. Larson takes on c2, getting a little extra material. The pawn goes to a5, and now queen to b2. By attacking this bishop at b6, he keeps the pawn from advancing, because uh, he would lose the bishop if the pawn were to move now. So Fisher plays bishop to d8 check. It moves the bishop away from the queen's threat with tempo. So he ha has to respond to the threat against his king, and now he can advance the pawn. The queen goes to a3 to attack the pawn, but now bishop to b7, and this is a very strong formation, the uh, a6 and b7 bishop working together. Uh, we can see Fisher's uh, advantage here coming to, to fruition. Queen to c5 to control the a7 square. Rook to b1, the idea is to support this bishop coming to b6 so that he can then push the pawn onto a7. c3, Larson hoping to irritate this rook sufficiently with this pawn so that he can do something about that advancing pawn at, at, on the a-file. Bishop to b6, he goes ahead with c2, uh, threatening to take the rook and promote to a queen with check. But Fisher plays this powerful idea, rook to e1 check, this intermediate move, really seals the deal. Uh, Larson blocks with the queen. Fisher takes rook, takes e5 check. King takes e5. And they, he doesn't, black doesn't resign yet. Interestingly, Fisher's most obvious win is just bishop to e3. And most people <laughs> would have just played that move. But Fisher, I think, had something on his chest. I think he, something to get off of his chest. He has something to prove here. Um, and he plays a7. I think this is the same kind of mentality that caused him to make that mistake in the first game against Spassky, where he grabbed that a7 pawn. Uh, but he's actually perfectly fine here. He has calculated this, and Larson promotes to a queen, and Fisher just plays bishop to g1, tucks the queen back, and there are just no checks at all, and there is nothing black can do to, to, to stop the pawn promoting to the a8 square. And uh, Fisher won this game, the first of six straight victories against the great Bent Larson, and what was, without a doubt, the greatest achievement in chess history, Fisher in the Candidates. I hope you've enjoyed this game. See you again soon at Chess Dog. Goodbye.